This file had to be reworked because it didn't have a good ending. So let's do this again. Before we hop into what's in this section, this is the nuclear model of atoms. If I look at what's on the left, I see the model Thompson proposed, where the electrons were very small and the positive charge was spread throughout the sphere. When I look at what Rutherford actually contributed, he showed that the opposite. He showed that the nucleus was very small in the center, and what sat around the atom was really the electron cloud. Now, he didn't quite say it that way, but that's really what his experiments led to. So as we go into this chapter, kind of get a grip on atomic size. We humans are on the order of two meters, but when we look at molecules, atoms, and atomic nuclei, we're down in the order of 10 to the minus 8th to 10 to the minus 12 meters. Since some of you are chemistry majors, but many of you are bio and biochem majors, think about it this way. We all know one centimeter is 2.54 inches. When we use a light microscope to look at different cells, we're looking on the order of micrometers. When we use an electron microscope, we're looking on the order of nanometers. Here we have our small molecules and our atoms way at the angstrom stage. And here we have the reason we're online right now, the coronavirus, okay? If we look at the modern view of the atom, what I want to direct your attention to is this little thing in the center. That's the nucleus that contains the protons and neutrons. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 4 angstroms. If I look at what I'll call the cloud, that's the volume that's occupied by the electrons, and that's 1 to 5 angstroms. So again, very, very, very small. To give you an idea, if this is the OSU stadium, that would be the atom. If I were to have a football down on the field, that would be the size of the nucleus, all right? Slide is a little busy, but on the bottom we have something I hope you're bringing from high school. Protons have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge, and neutrons have no charge at all. In terms of masses, I think this might be something that you're not quite as aware. Protons and neutrons have a mass of 1, whereas electrons have a mass of 10 to the minus 4. They are much, much, much lighter, okay? If I look at this slide, this is the way we designate things. X is the symbol that we use for an element, and we will see that on the periodic table. Z is the atomic number and that is the number of protons and electrons, and the number of protons, that sets the symbol. And the symbol, again, is the element. What's the A? Well, the A is the atomic mass, and it's the sum of the protons and the neutrons. Let's do three elements to illustrate this. Hydrogen mass of one, atomic number one. Carbon a mass of 12, atomic number six. Chlorine, atomic mass of 35, atomic number 17. For hydrogen, one proton, one electron, zero neutrons, one minus one. For carbon, six protons, six electrons, 12 minus six, we come up with six neutrons. For chlorine, 17 protons, 17 electrons, and we have 35 minus 17, or atrium neutrons. That should be a skill you've brought with you from high school. Being able to look at the element symbol and coming up with a number of protons, electrons, and neutrons. What you may be asked to do in our class is the following problem. It asks for the diameter of lead of a mechanical pencil if all of the atoms were laid side to side. Now, how can a lead pencil have carbon atoms? Well, a lead pencil is made of carbon in the form of graphite. So what do you need to solve this problem? Well, I see millimeters, and I guess I have to kind of walk you through it. I know that one meter is 10 to the third millimeters. I also know that one meter is 10 to the 10th angstroms. What I need to look up is what is the carbon atom diameter. So. You'll see problem solving. You do need to practice because sometimes it feels like we're taking this out of thin air. 1.54 angstroms for every carbon atom. So I'm going to use the technique we taught, the method we taught in chapter one. I'm going to start with my 0.770 mil millimeters of my mechanical pencil. I'm going to say one meter 
is 10 to the third millimeters. And then I'm gonna say there are 10 to the 10th angstroms for every meter. Then I'm gonna say every carbon atom, 1.54 angstroms for one carbon atom. Now you say, how did you know how to set this up? I mean, that's why we have to practice. This is memorized, this becomes memorized, the other is looked up, but all of these are the conversion factors that we taught how to use in dimension analysis in chapter one. So you're gonna be using a lot of the methods taught in chapter one as we work our way through. When I crunch my numbers, 4.5 times 10 to the fifth is the value. We see here two significant figures. I've written two significant figures, but I don't really think we can talk about half an atom. We'll see 10 to the fifth carbon atoms are aligned side by side in this mechanical pencil lead. The next section 2.4 is facts. In the beginning, when they analyzed 100 grams of water, 11.1 grams of hydrogen, 88.9 grams of oxygen. That's the law of constant composition. No matter what size water sample was taken, you'd always have 11.1% hydrogen, 88.9% oxygen. So that led people to believe eight times as much oxygen as hydrogen. Then as they look deeper, they saw that water had two hydrogens for each oxygen. So that eight turned into the number of 16. At that point, they arbitrarily assigned hydrogen the mass of one, and everything else was assigned relative to hydrogen. That's how oxygen became 16. So I'll just draw a little line here because that's really the demarcation. If we look at how things are done today, a high degree of accuracy as you look at those numbers. By definition, one atomic mass unit, so I really should have three lines here, is this many grams. Think about chapter one where we use conversion factors. What if we wanted to express grams in terms of atomic mass units? Oh, do you recognize that number? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd? That is Avogadro's number. So again, lots of work has gone into this, but essentially our take home message is an atomic mass unit is precisely defined by assigning a mass of exactly 12 to carbon 12. Now that's the mass of carbon. Let's look at the next slide. What we have here are other forms of carbon. We have a carbon 13 and we have a carbon 14. What are those? Those are called isotopes. They have the same atomic number, but they have a different mass number. All of these carbons have six protons and six electrons. Carbon 12 has six neutrons. Carbon 13 has seven neutrons. Carbon 14 has eight neutrons. Take a look at the bottom, the learning outcome. You have to be able to find protons, neutrons, and electrons four different isotopes. So where do those masses come from? Well, it's a technique called mass spectrophotometry. We just show you a picture of it here. What we're really stressing is how to find all the different parts. Hydrogen, one proton, one electron, but we'll have zero neutrons, one neutron, and two neutrons, depending on the isotope we have. If I look at uranium, that's involved in nuclear weapons and nuclear reactions, all uraniums have 92 protons and they have 92 electrons. Uranium-235, it's going to have 143 neutrons. Uranium-238, it's going to have 146 neutrons. So again, protons, neutrons, electrons for elements as well as their isotopes. We've said this, but if I look at the periodic table, where did this number come from for chlorine? I mean, we've been using these whole numbers in our, in our examples. Well, chlorine exists as two different isotopes. One of them is 75%, one of them is 24%. What we do is we take those percentages and we turn them into decimal equivalents. We multiply them by the signal that was given at each of those masses. And that's where we come up with the number 
35.453 AMU. This would have been my stopping point on an exam I wrote but we now have common exams, and I have to go a little bit deeper. Where did those percentages come from? Well, this signal intensity is about 25%. This signal intensity is about 25%. Signal intensity on the y-axis, atomic mass on the x-axis. So we don't go real deep, but you will be applying this sometimes to a picture. My last slide here has two examples. We'll soon be talking about cations. And so we know how to find protons, neutrons, and electrons for elements. We know how to find it for isotopes. What we're going to learn in the next section is how to do it for ions. The second question that was asked on a midterm, people were told magnesium has three isomers. Select the correct output for magnesium. Well, the first thing you had to do was go into the periodic table and find the mass of magnesium that is listed there. Then think about how we talked about the percentages and the peaks. Now what you have to do is apply it. I'm not giving any more hints because they always say you shouldn't give a person fish, you should teach them how to fish. So have fun learning how to solve problems. Please continue to ask questions.